God is good. Amen. Y'all are a little more awake than the first service. <laughs> I understand why, because there was an hour change. And, and some of you, I think, were from the first service. No, I'm <laughs> Praise God. It's so good to be here. Amen. So good to be in the house of the Lord this morning with you that we get to come into his house. We get to learn of him, glorify his name, exalt him in all that we do. And that's our that's our whole desire is to glorify God, to, to lift him up, that he would be exalted. If you have your Bibles, Matthew chapter 28, we're going to begin where we left off last week and and just carry it carry this thought a little bit further, if you would. Because I believe that God, everything that he does, the Bible teaches us that he does for his glory. But everything that's happening in your life, he works it out for your good. Now, doesn't mean for your happiness. <laughs> we, all, we, we all just want to be happy all the time. Well, I can tell you this. You'll be filled with joy. Happiness is based on your circumstances. Joy is filled based on your relationship with God. And I want to, and I want to have joy, uh, a joy-filled life. I want to have a joy-filled heart. I want to, I want to always be joyful in all things and all that I do, that I can bring Him glory. If you'd stand this morning, Matthew chapter twenty-eight. Stand for the reading of God's word. If you're able to praise God, Matthew twenty-eight verse eighteen, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, "All power." is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Father, I just want to say thank you this morning. Thank you, God, for the revelation of who you are. Thank you, God, for revealing your word. Holy Spirit, thank you for being a revealer and revealing to us the secrets, the mysteries of God that have been hidden through the ages but have been there brought to us, unfolded, God, for our good for our development, that God, that you would, you have desired, Father, to reveal these things from the very beginning. And God, we are, a, we are a chosen generation, Father, set apart, Father, unto you to do good works, God, to glorify your name, to exalt you, God, that the world would see and know that you are alive today, moving and ministering, touching, healing your people, God. We give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Look at somebody before you're seated and tell them you're so glad they're here. Praise God. Praise God. <clears throat> As we learned last week, Jesus said all power is given in heaven and in earth that is given unto him. Because he had secured a body. Amen. <clears throat> and in doing so, all power in heaven and in earth had been given to him. As we said, the devil thought that he had won, but he did not realize that from the very beginning, God had a plan that was already in place. Now, he had secured a body, and so he was ready to deliver this unto his children, unto the disciples. But, you know... It's, it amazes me because everything that God does, he does for a reason and a purpose. Now, in, in, in understanding this, that God says, all power is given unto me, and he had secured a body, this is why, again, it is so important for us. It is of utmost importance for the body of Christ, as Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 says, to offer your body as a living sacrifice Holy and acceptable unto God, which is the least that we can do. It's a reasonable service in light of everything that Jesus has done for us. So that he can pour himself in us and through us. As he does, he receives the glory, but you get the benefits. But sometimes we're focused on the benefits and Jesus says, don't seek. He says, seek first the kingdom of heaven, his righteousness. All these things are, will be added unto you. Now... In John chapter 4, God reveals something to us. Now, this message today, it's, it's one of those you're going to have to... <laughs> Anybody who's here first service understands. Um, feels like when you go to the doctor's office. How many of you like going to the doctor's office? Nobody likes going. 
And, and many times we don't like going to the doctor's office because we already know what he's going to tell us, huh? Yeah, we don't like to hear it, amen? Well, this might be one of those messages that rides right along those lines. We, we, don't, like to, we don't like to come because, oh my, he's going to tell us what we already know. But John chapter 4, verse 23, he says, But the hour comes and now is. When the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship Him. God is a spirit. And they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. That word must means that this is a spiritual law. The only way that we can truly worship God is when the spirit is worshiping God. The woman said unto him, verse 25, I know that Messiah comes, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee, I am he. Now what happens, this is, this is the thing. <clears throat> Jesus says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We have been talking about fasting. And fasting really is in obedience with the word of God. And it's, and it's not to be abused because, because we can take fasting and, and what, it's very, what it's meant for and abuse it. And then it doesn't mean what it meant anymore. Just like everything. We're, you know, we humans, we're good at things like that. Taking something that was meant for good and then turning it around and, and, and then abusing it. Pharisees were known for this. That's why the Pharisees said, we fast twice a week. And they were, they were talking about their, their, their pompous pride and, and how they did it. And they used it for their own glory, not really for the glory of God. So we know that God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. In 1 Corinthians, and I know I'm giving you a lot of scripture right up front. But we're laying a foundation for where we're going this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, the Bible says what happens when we begin to truly worship God in spirit and in truth. It doesn't happen just because you raised your hands this morning and sang a song. It doesn't happen just because you said it happened. No, this only happens when we in, a, in obedience to God worship Him in spirit and in truth. We're going to deal with that. But 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. He says, But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. In other words, when we begin to really worship God in spirit and in truth, what we do is, in the spirit, I behold God face to face. And as a result, I'm being changed into his likeness. I am becoming like Jesus Christ. I am, I am truly, my, my will is fading away. My desires are fading away. I am becoming more and more like Christ. I am looking into, beholding him in the spirit and being transformed because I've come to a place. So what the Bible teaches us that through the fast, because this is what we've been talking about, is as we keep our side of the covenant by keeping the flesh down through fasting and lifting the spirit through prayer, the Spirit of God, like a river, begins to flow through us. And, and as the Spirit flows through us, it brings with it the power and the glory and the presence of God. When, when we're beholding Christ and we're, and we're truly fasting in the right way and praying through, we're beholding Him in the Spirit. We're being changed, transformed into His likeness. The power of God begins to break forth in our lives. And the spirit and the presence of God begin to move. Now, let's go back to Isaiah because this has been our foundational verse, uh, chapter. Isaiah 58. 
I believe this is week number four that we've been on this. In Isaiah 58, um, so powerful that, and I thank God for the fast that he's given us. I thank God for the, for, 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 for fasting. And we're going to realize a little bit more why, but it's very needful for the human being. Because God doesn't just give us things just to give us things. But Isaiah 58, in verse 8, begins with a little word, then. That word, then, is indicating that something came before it. So then means after. After what? After verses 6 and 7 that we've already dealt with. After the yoke of the flesh has been broken through fasting. Then this is what happens. It says, then shall your light break forth as the morning. Now the Bible teaches us in, in John chapter 1 and verse 4 that, that Jesus Christ, the Bible says, in him was life. And that life it was the light of men. Now, you have to understand that Jesus, in him was life. He is antecedent to all things. The Bible declares that he is before all things, before the world was created, before the heavens were made, before the stars were formed, before everything, in him was life. So everything that we see, everything that is, is because of him, because of Christ. In other words, everything came out of him. Everything that we see, we know the Bible says in Hebrews, was made out of nothing. Meaning, there was nothing there. It was only him. And so everything came out of him. He spoke the worlds into existence. And there they were. There was no matter. There was no mass. There was nothing. All of it came out of him. Now, he is the uncaused cause. He's the beginning of all things. See, in him was life. And the life was the light of men. Now Jesus declares to us in John chapter 8 and verse 12. He says, I am the light of the world. As I said, I'm going to be throwing some, some scripture around today. He says, I am the light of the world. Before his departure to the disciples, this is what he tells. I'm the light of the world. We understand that. Jesus came as a representative of who we would, would become. Now, you have to remember that Jesus was the firstborn, the Bible th declares. Jesus was the firstborn of a new race. Jesus was the firstborn of a new race. Romans talks about this. That Jesus being born of a new race, the firstborn of a new race, meaning he was the very first one that would produce after his kind. In other words, everyone that would come from him and do likewise would be like him. Therefore, the Bible then declares to us that he said, I'm the light of the world. And then he says in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14, he tells the disciples that you are the light of the world. In other words, everything that I am, you will become. Other than God. Everything that he was here on earth. We would become here on earth. As he was in this world. So are we. As he was in this. So are we. So we are becoming. That's why when we're worshiping him in spirit and in truth. We're being transformed. Changed into his likeness. In other words we're becoming like him. Now. When that light shines, um, it begins to glorify God. Now, the Bible tells us that when we receive the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, in Romans chapter 8 and verse 2, it says that the Spirit is the Spirit of life. In other words, it is life that, that, that God gives us, and it's this life that makes us the body of Christ. Now, the fact is this, and this is, this is where it kind of becomes disappointing. Is in, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, and I want you to see this. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, and 
I don't like to say the verse because then people come jump and start reading. So I kind of hold off a little bit. I still hear pages flipping. Praise God. He says, let your light shine. He says, let your light so shine before men. Let your light so shine before men. Now, here's the thing. And here's the fact that that, that can be disappointing is that this life or this light can be in us and never be seen. You can have the life and the light of God living in you and nobody else see it. Because that very very word right there, the stress is on the verb, let. In other words, that is a decision. That is a choice that you will make whether you allow this light to be seen or or you don't. So God is light. God is light. So he says, let your light shine before men. So our, our only source of light is God within us. And we can hold God and conceal him from the rest of the world. That's why the Bible teaches us. No man lights a, lights a candle and puts it under a bushel. But our light is to shine like a city on a hill. So that everyone that looks can see. See, there's a, the, the thing is, is the, the, one of the reasons why this light doesn't shine or we don't let it shine is because there's another life in us. And we've dealt with this, but it is the life of the flesh. So to let our light shine, we have to deal with. A death blow to the flesh. Don't you remember we've been talking about how the flesh and the spirit are at war with one another. They're contrary one to another, one to the other. So that we cannot do the things that God desires us to do. Or the things that we want to do in, in the name of Christ. So in other words, if Jesus is to be seen in us, in you and I, the flesh has to be crucified as john puts it in three john three thirty, i have to decrease that he may increase and this is something that each one of us should desire as believers i must decrease he must increase every day i'm decreasing every day he should be increasing every day i'm decreasing and every day he should be increasing Until it's more of him and less of me. More of him and less of me. Until we get to the place where it's all of him and none of me. All of him and none of me. As I'm beholding in the spirit. As I'm becoming like him. I have to decrease that he might increase. The old man has to be broken through the fast that God has chosen. And the spiritual man begins to assert himself. And As the spiritual man begins to to assert himself and take that ascendancy, all of a sudden wonderful things begin to happen. I'm telling you, anything is possible when when the spiritual man begins to to take take his rightful place. See, when the river begins to flow, I can tell you, you don't have to, to beg a river to flow. All you have to do is remove the restrictions and that river will begin to flow. And so this is what God has done is God has given us a wonderful tool to to accomplish this. And that tool is the fast. Look what he says, because Isaiah 58, again, is dealing with fasting. Is not this the fast that I've chosen? He says, then he says, "And, and your health shall spring forth speedily. In other words, the life of God shall break forth. Your health shall spring forth speedily. Now, here's the thing. I believe in divine healing. But right here, God is speaking of the church itself. The church has been a place where it's supposed to represent life. It's supposed to represent rivers of living water breaking forth from us to the healing of the nations, answering all the problems that the world is facing should come right out of the church, but it can't. Something's blocking. This is what the Bible calls the fast. Now, your health is going to spring forth speedily. I was... Reading a book, this been reading a book a couple 
weeks now just dealing with fasting and been doing some just some research and everything and Nelda and I were there at the hospital in the waiting room and and I, I began to understand began to, God's dealing with us we're fasting and and praying and and uh I came across this part where it talked about how we are ruled by our stomachs. The Bible, the Bible says this of the people of Israel, oftentimes that they were ruled by their stomachs. Their stomach or their belly was their God. You know, I read that a lot of times through my walk with God, and, and, and I understood to a degree what it meant. But as I began to just meditate and, and really think about what God was saying as we were sitting there um, Nelda was off getting some, some test or something run and, and I was just sitting there listening and the people around me I promise you I, I believe it was just ordained of God the people around me started saying well you know what what are you going to eat I'm going to eat this I'm going to eat that I can't wait till it comes to and then two People took off and they went out and they got their lunch. What did you eat? What did you get? And what did you get? And so then a couple others went off and they went to get the, there was a couple people sitting in the waiting room. Oh man, I can't wait until, I can't wait till we get out. I'm, I'm so hungry. I'm going to eat this and I'm going to eat that. And, 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 and it was just everything revolved around eating. What I began to realize was that's me. That's us. We are ruled by our stomachs. We eat things when we really don't, we're not hungry. Just sounds good. You're not hungry, but boy, that sounds good. Let's stop at the store. Let's just grab, grab a little snack. Oh, we had, we had one serving. Why not get two or three servings? One was good. The other might be even better. And, 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 we, and, and it's always around the eating. And then I realized... It's so true. We don't understand what fasting really is and how fasting helps us. Because here's the thing. The Bible says first the natural, then the spiritual. First the natural, then the spiritual. As I was reading, I, I began to understand what fasting really was. And, what, and, and, and here's, there's a purpose why God gave us the fast, physical and spiritual. Ultimately, the spiritual is better than the physical. But Paul says, bodily exercise profits, profits little, but it still profits. But spiritual exercise is much greater. That's what Paul's emphasis was. So when you begin to fast, and we're talking about the whole fast, and I was reading up on it. And the whole fast, the whole fast is no food. That's what Jesus did for 40 days and 40 nights. Whole fast, no food, water only. Because the body can go about three days without water, but it can, go, it can actually go 40 days without food. And then they, then, and, and the medical experts say, well, this di differs on the person. So what happens is when you begin to fast and a complete fast is in the first week, you get headaches and other things because the toxins are coming out of your, out of your blood, out of your mind and, and out of your body. And, and, and between week one and week two, the body is burning off all of the extra stuff, fecal matter and stuff that's in our stomach. We don't like to hear about that stuff. At any given time, a human being can have upwards of 25 plus pounds of fecal matter in their intestines. We don't. And so as it eats that away between week one and two, then it starts... Once it cleans that out, um, the person will, after that, begin to feel a little lethargic between weeks three and four. They'll feel dizzy. They'll feel this. They'll feel that. The body doesn't need food. But what it's doing is it begins to eat all the dead cells that have accumulated throughout the body. Now, there's a lot of dead stuff in us. That stuff causes diseases, it causes sicknesses, it causes all kinds of things. And so as it does that, after it gets past that stage, then between three, week three and four, um, all of a sudden the person starts getting a, li a, a little more energy. And they feel like, man, I could live like this. 
I could actually stay like this because now the body is, is eating all of the stuff that is accumulated. It's not bad in the sense of it dead stuff, but it's now eating all of the other stuff. And between four, week four and five, all of a sudden what begins to happen, and it just depends on the person, is between week four and five, all of a sudden pain will begin to move in. And they said, now this pain is a different type of pain. And when you've reached this point, now what's happening is the body begins to eat on the living tissue, the good stuff. And it's at that point, you know, you've reached the place where you've reset your body. And then you ease into it slowly. But here's the thing that they've learned. Because in nature, what happens is when an animal is sick, it will stop eating. Any of you have a dog? Any of you have cats? Any? <clears throat> It'll stop eating. What it does, and the reason it stops eating is because it knows that it's sick. And God has placed a healing mechanism within the natural body to heal itself. And so the, the animal will stop eating in order to get whatever is in there out of its system so that it can begin to be healed. You know, the eagle, the eagle, when it eats something dead by mistake, because an eagle, is, an eagle only li eats living things. It will hunt only living things, and it will only eat those things that are freshly killed that it kills and eats. But if by accident it eats something dead and sickness comes into its body, we have a term called spread eagle. An eagle will fly to the highest mountain and he will find the highest rock. And he will spread his wings out across that rock. And he will lay there for several hours as the sun pulls the sickness out of his body. It's amazing how in nature we understand these things. Oh, but I can tell you there's those that don't like us to understand them in the physical and the natural. So when we get sick sometimes, all of a sudden, what is, what is one of the first things that happens when you get sick? You lose your appetite. And what do they say? Oh, you need to eat something. You need to, you need to eat something. You need, no, you might need to drink a little bit of water. But they, you need to eat something. What your body is saying, I'm, 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 I'm going to engage my healing properties so that I can begin to rid myself of this disease. And it has been proven that sicknesses and diseases have actually been eradicated out of the body through fasting. And this is not even people that are spiritual. This is just medical. That there are things that have been eradicated out of the body because the body was able to, to get it out of its own system. But what we do is we fill it and we pack it in there and we fill it and it never has a, a chance to process even what it has. And so that fire never gets to burn all of the garbage out of us. Now, first the natural, then the spiritual. So God has given us the fast as the body of Christ because he desires for us to be efficient. He expects for us to be, to, to be ready he wants us to be well. He wants us to be healed. And so look at what it says in 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it's a powerful thing that God has given us through the fast. That God has given it to us for physical means. And this is where many other religions <clears throat> have gone to the place where they, they fast and they, because they understand that there is a benefit to fasting in the spiritual sense, even though they may be worshiping other gods, because what they do is they may make themselves more acutely aware to the spirits that are out there. And so there are many religions that fast. There are people that are not religious at all. They fast for health benefits. But the beautiful thing about the Bible and about, the, about Christians is <clears throat> fasting not only helps us physically, but boy, I can tell you this, that cannot be compared to what happens spiritually. When we come to the place where we begin to hear the voice of God, 
<clears throat> so in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, starting with verse 19, <clears throat> the Bible says this. He says, what? He says, know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? Which you have of God, and you are not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. In other words, this body and the spirit that dwells in it belong to God. And so the apostle is saying, because what was happening was the Corinthian church, they were abusing their bodies, not just... Not just through food and other things like that, because that's, that's one of the ways that we, we, we abuse it but too much. But they were also abusing their body through sexual immorality and all of these other things. And, 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 and Paul is coming to them saying, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? And that you belong to God? You have been bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ? Now, here's the thing. We believe what God says, right? I believe what God says for, for, for you, for me. And I believe that he works all things together for my good. So when I look in the word of God, what happens is I understand I may not always like it, but I need it. When I'm walking in obedience to God, obedience positions me to receive what God has for me. See, I can't receive the things that God has for me if I am not being obedient to the word of God. And so what God wants to do is when we are in obedience to his word, all of a sudden his word goes to work. Because every promise is conditional. And we'll get there just even a little further. But every promise is conditional. So when I'm walking in obedience, then the word goes to work. Then all of a sudden, the spirit of God begins to work in me. See, and, and this is what God wants to do. He wants to heal us. And so, first the natural, then the spiritual. So when the body is healed, when the body comes to the place of healing, all of a sudden... Now you can do things that you weren't able to do. Now you can help. Now you can, now, now, now you, you feel a lot better about yourself. You've, and, and, and here's the thing. I'm not saying we shouldn't enjoy food. I'm not saying that at all. The Bible says he was taking them into a land of flowing with milk and honey. So there's a place, a time and a place to enjoy the things that God has given us. There's a time to celebrate. There's a time to, there's a time I believe to, to fast and there's a time to feast. There's, there's times for everything. But these things are still not to be abused. And, and it doesn't mean that everybody's going to have a chiseled body and, you know, we're all going to walk around with you. Know, it's not that. But we can glorify God in the way that we live or we can, we can not glorify God. So once the body's healed, all of a sudden you're able to do things that you weren't able to do. All of a sudden you're, you, you, feel, you feel better. All of a sudden things begin to change and it's just kind of like, man, if I would have known this, well, now you do. So now, then the spiritual. When we get the body healed, the body of Christ will heal every, every, everything that it touches and everywhere that it goes. You see, how can, how can I bring healing when I'm, the one that's, when I'm the one that's spiritually sick? I can't give you what I don't have. If I don't have a relationship with God, I, how can I give you a relationship? How can I show you? How can I let my light shine if my light isn't shining? How can, I, how can I allow those things to happen in my life if I'm not being obedient to God and first doing the things that he's asked me to do? As I said, I don't always like it, but I know that it's right and I know that I need to do it. So when we're sick, we're brought, the, the, the Bible tells us when we're sick, we need to come to God and ask for healing, but we need to put ourselves in a place. The Bible says that when the sick were brought to Christ, he healed every single one of them. There were, there were times they brought, the demon possessed were delivered. The sick were healed. 
All of a sudden, mental health was, 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 was being done away. All, Jesus, they brought him to him. Every one of them were healed and sent home whole and made well. And Jesus said, greater things would you do than I have done. As I said, I still believe in divine healing. But God has got to get it in us and through us before he can ever put it into this world. Because as we said last week, we are the body of Christ. And God desires everything that he does, he does through his body. A body thou hast prepared for me. Romans chapter 8 says this. Because again, Jesus healed those that were brought to him. And we being the body of Christ, this is what Jesus was saying is, the same things I'm doing, you will do also. Romans 8 verse 11, it says, But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. He, meaning the spirit of God, that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. So in other words, that spirit, that same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will quicken or make alive our bodies. We all of a sudden are, are aware of the spirit and the presence of God. Remember, worshiping God in spirit and in truth. All of a sudden, I'm, I am made aware because the spirit of God begins, he's living in me. I'm made aware of the presence of God now. Something that I wasn't aware of before I came to know Jesus Christ was the Spirit of God, the presence of God flowed. And, and if we're not careful, what happens is we degenerate back into that place where we, we, we become dull in our senses, the Bible says, that we no longer sense the presence of God. We sear the consciences with a hot iron. So we, we fall back into the places. Now hear me, most sickness, spiritual Physical, mental, uh, is caused by tension, depression, and here's selfishness. Because for the most part, tension and, and, and all of these things is produced by selfishness. And, and, and why? Because for the most part, these are a product of disobedience see God doesn't change his word for anyone the Bible says that he's the same yesterday today and forever and so God doesn't change and God's not going to God doesn't have to use anyone that does not fit the criteria that does not want to be a part of it God is not going to force you and me he will only bring us in as we want to be brought in Jesus sat on the mountain the Bible says looked over Jerusalem and he and he says these words over Jerusalem he says how many times have I wanted to bring you under my wings as a mother hen brings her chicks? But you would not. How many times have I wanted to bring you and protect you and keep you from your enemies? How many times have I wanted to heal you and break the curse over you? But I'm not here to force you. But you would not. I can only imagine what Jesus was feeling in that moment. When he wanted to do something, but they would not. You know, it said that a laser beam, when it comes in contact with an ob object, a laser, a laser beam, if there's no resistance whatsoever, it will push that object at the speed of light through space. If there's no resistance. If there is resistance, that laser will push its way through and destroy whatever gets in its way. When we are obedient to God, what we do is we allow the Spirit of God to thrust us to places we've never been before. When we resist God, God begins to destroy those things in our lives. 
Oh, I know, I know that. As I said, this is a, this is a doctor's visit this morning. We don't like to hear what the word of God says. I, I like it when I can get into church and they, whoo, praise God. So when God touches our life, he begins to move in us. And the word of, the, the word of light, the spirit of God begins to push in and through us. And this is why the Bible tells us, lay aside every weight in the sin that would so easily beset us. Why? Because God wants to, us to go forward. Lay aside every weight in the sin that would so easily beset us, keeping your eyes on the author and finisher of your faith, Jesus Christ, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, the shame. Why? Because he loved you. So God wants to push us forward, but the old man that is, that is resisting has to die. And the word of God does its work. And thank God for the fast because the fast helps us. Look again, Isaiah chapter 58. This is what he says. This is what he says. So as we're walking in the spirit, we're laying aside the weights and those things that would resist the presence and the power of God from being at work in our life. Because I can tell you this, I want the word of God to work in me. I don't want to just be a hearer of the word and say, man, that sounds so good. Man, those people must have had it really good. Oh, man, God was really doing a work and God was really performing miracles, but never experienced it in my own life. I want to actually be a part of what God is doing. I want to experience it. So whatever it is, God, help me to push out all of that stuff and get rid of all the garbage. He says, your health shall spring forth speedily. Your righteousness, which is Jesus Christ, shall go before you, and the glory of the Lord shall be your reward. So God is saying, and this only works with the spirit man. Remember in the garden, when, when the fall happened, and God chased him out, and there were seraphims and, and flaming swords that would keep him out. And God told, in essence, Adam and Eve, he said, your kind can never come into my presence again, because no flesh glories in my presence. Only the spiritual man can come in here. <clears throat> Only the person that is born of God. Only the person that is obedient to the Spirit. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey me. That's what he says. And then he said, and if you, and if you love me, my Father will love you. And then he said, if you don't love me, you won't obey me. Oh, we've made that legalism. I can tell you this, folks. That isn't legalism. That's called obedience. God only works with the spirit man. So as we continue to crucify the old man, put him down, and allow the new man to, to, to rise to that place of ascendancy, more and more the desires of our heart, we, we realize that, that we want them to be towards God, but we realize what they really are. And if we're not careful, I can tell you this, the desires of our heart, they're selfish, they're wicked. Even in our prayers many times, we say things like this. God, if, you can fill in the blank, if you'll heal me, if you'll, if you'll meet this need, if you'll do, the, then I will, oh my, my will. And then we don't want to say it because we know that it's wrong, but as if God doesn't see our thoughts from afar off or doesn't know the, the, the inclinations of our mind and our spirits that is within us, we, we try to mask it and say, oh, you know what, God, I just need your healing. And then in our mind, it's just kind of, we're trying to get that thing out of there. God, if you do it, I'll do it. I have this need, God. I have this need, which the Bible tells us, and we'll get there. Bring every need. But when's the last time we sat in the presence of God and asked God, God, what is it that you need? God, what is it that you want out of my life today? God, how can I minister to you? See, because we were all called to be priest. That's what the Bible says. We were all called to be a priestly nation. That's what the, Israel, the Israelites were really called to be, a priestly nation. You know what the priests did? The priests were the mediators, in a sense. They ministered unto God. 
and God would minister to the people through them. See, but you and I are, are priests. We should be ministering to God. In other words, we should be coming before God and saying, God, what is your will? What is your desire for this people around me? What is your desire for my home? What is your desire for my family? What is your desire for my finances? What is your desire for... God, what is your desire? What is your desire? Listen what it says in Isaiah 58 and verse 9. He says, he says this, because when we're walking in the Spirit, because God only speaks to the man of the Spirit... He says, then shall you call and the Lord shall answer. You shall cry and he shall say, <clears throat> here I am. If you take away from the midst of thee the yoke and the putting forth of the finger and the speaking of vanity. Think about this. <clears throat> he was saying in the beginning of this chapter, he was saying, you fast, if you fast as you do this day, and you expect your voice to be heard on high. He says, I'm not listening. So in the context of fasting, when we do it correctly. And I'm not saying God, everybody, no. You need to ease into a fast. If you, if you plan on doing a 40-day complete fast, I'm telling you, you better ease into it. Unless God himself spoke to you and said, let's do this. Because you're going to be in a world of trouble. <clears throat> so he says this. He says, the Lord shall answer, and thou shalt cry, and he shall say, here I am. In other words, when the new creation that has been held in bondage, because these are the bands that need to be loosed. These, this is the yoke that needs to be broken. And the way I see it is the spiritual man has been held in a dungeon, in a prison, in chains, covered by, by brick and concrete, and what fasting does, and that concrete, those chains and those things are the flesh that has taken ascendancy that, that when you want to pray, you can't pray because the flesh says, I'm too tired. When you want to do something spiritual and you don't, the flesh says, no, because I don't feel like doing that right now. I'll do it later. And we never get to it. And the flesh is always the one. And so that, that when, when we begin to fast, what happens is the chains are broken the concrete is busted up and the spiritual man now can cry out to God. Because we have been praying in the flesh and not in the spirit. You know, God will hear us every time. But too often when we're praying in the flesh, the flesh is trying to get its way. Trying to get its agenda across. Oh God, I... I just want to, I just want to, I just want to, I just want to, <clears throat> God, I want this and I want, and, and, and it's not, God, I need, I need, it's, God, I, I, I just want to, and, and, if, and if I could just, and if I just had this, and God, if you would just do this in my life as if God was the one to blame. You think not? Well, here's the thing. Here's a little test. You ever got mad at God for not answering your prayer? You had the ability to do it, and you could have done this, and you could have done that. And, and, and God's saying, that's the flesh. What about get to a place where we just call upon, not my will, but your will be done. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, it was said of those, they were not looking for deliverance, but a better resurrection. In other words, they weren't looking to be set free from prisons. They weren't looking to be set free from the beast that was about to devour them. They weren't looking to be set free from those things that were coming against them. They just said, not my will, your will be done. Looking for a better resurrection. I'm here to do your will, O oh God. Would you come? See, the world... The world prays, heathens pray, but I can tell you this, God hears when the spiritual man cries. In 1 John chapter 3, the Bible says in verse 22, 1 John chapter 3 verse 23, 22, he says, and whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. Now hear this because conviction Goes right in line with his word. That whatsoever we ask we receive of him because. There's the conjunction. 
There's, there, there it is. Because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. I, I would, I, I'm not saying it's always the case. But I would dare say there's a, probably a good majority of prayers that have never been a- answered. Because I, I, I would dare say, because I've had to ask myself this hard question many times. Have you, have you really kept the word of God? Have you been really, and I'm, and I'm talking about me, I'm not talking about you. I have to, I'm telling you, I have to get honest with God oftentimes. I have to have that moment where me and Jesus have a meeting. And I just come, and I, and I just come before God. And I, God, um, I don't think you've been center in my life. God, I haven't been putting you first in my life. God, I haven't been, I haven't been faithful to my devotion. I haven't been faithful to, to, to praying and seeking your face, God. I haven't been, I haven't been faithful. And it's in those moments where the spirit man begins to ascend and take his place. So we don't, again, we don't, like to, we don't like to think like that. We don't like to hear these things, but these are the things that need to be heard. Why? Because, in other words, if, if they're not heard and we don't listen and we don't obey... We're going to keep that power of God behind closed doors. That healing isn't going to flow. That power isn't going to move. See, the bottom line is that God will have nothing to do with the old man. God only listens to the new man. This is what David meant in Psalm chapter 42 and verse 7 when he says, Deep calls unto deep. In other words, the Spirit of God in me cries out to God himself. And when God hears the spirit of God in me, he answers every single time. I I, I can tell, I've been in a crowd at times. I've been in a crowd and, and I've heard kids cry. Our kids, mom, dad, never even looked over my shoulder. Never even turned around. Oh, but I know the sound of mine. I could tell you we could be in a crowded room and all of a sudden I could hear my wife and I could hear our baby cry and the first thing whew, somebody else's kid cry they just well you know when it's a desperate cry or not but when, when my kid cries whew, and God is saying when my spirit in you begins to cry out to me I'll hear him every single time now listen to this I'm going to close with this in Ezekiel chapter 36. In Ezekiel 36, I want you to turn there with me. And we'll close with this. God has made many promises. He's given us so much in his word that he desires to do. The children of Israel in Ezekiel's time, they had defamed the name of God. They had provoked God. They had served false idols and false gods. They they, they had really taken God's name in vain in in many ways. They did not obey him. They did not do the things. They they found themselves in trouble. They would cry out to God. God would deliver them, bring them home. They would fall back, and it was just a cycle. You you see it all through the Old Testament. Can I tell you this? If we're not careful, we we fall right into that cycle if we're not careful. I I don't want that cycle to happen anymore in my life. I want to live in a way that I'm walking in the spirit at all times. I want God to hear me. And so this is what God does in his mercy and in his love and his kindness and his grace. This is what he does. He offers them another opportunity. And so the Bible tells us this in 2 Samuel 14 and 14. That God devises ways that when we've strayed from him, God devises ways to bring us home. In other words, he does things in our life and he works it out to where we have another opportunity to repent, another opportunity to come back, another opportunity. God does this in our lives. He brings brings us back. But we have to respond. And listen to what he says. He says, after I've healed them, after I've done these things, this is what I'm going to do. Verse 33, God begins to lay out promises that he's he's making to the children of Israel. Excuse me. 
Thus says the Lord God, in the day that I shall have cleansed you from all your iniquities, I will also cause you to dwell in cities and in the, and the waste shall be builded. And the desolate land shall be tilled, whereas it lay desolate in the sight of all that, tras- tras- uh, that passed by. And they shall say, this land that was desolate is become like a garden. Oh, that sounds like health coming back. That sounds like life coming back. That sounds like God is saying, I'm going to restore all things. I'm going to give you double for your trouble. Remember what he did to, to, to Job? He said, I'm going to give you seven times what you lost. Seven times what the enemy took away from you. I'm going to give it back to you. Praise God. He says, of, he says uh, this land that was desolate, it shall become like the garden of Eden. And the waste and desolate and ruined cities are become fenced and now are inhabited. Oh, God's going to cause you to live. He says in verse 36, And then and the heathen that are left round about you shall know that I, the Lord, build the ruined places and plant that that was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it and I will do it. Well, praise God. This is what God is saying. I'm going to restore you. I'm going to build you up. The places that you used to inhabit, I'm going to bring you back in. We're going to rebuild the cities, rebuild the walls, fortify them. The garden is going to, your, 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 your place is going to be like the Garden of Eden, flowing with milk and honey, more than you could ever have, more than you can enjoy. And he says, and I am going to do it. Praise God. The problem is this. That's where we stop. We stop right there. Oh, God said. God said he's, you know, he's not giving me a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. Yeah, but I need to walk in obedience. Greater is he that lives in me than he that's in this world. But yes, but I'm, am I living according to the word and the will of God? Because when I do, I position myself and the word goes to work. The word begins to work. That's what God said. He said he will not re- his word will not return void unto him. It will do what he's called it and commanded it to do. And so God has given the children of Israel a word. I'm going to do all of these things in spite of the way that you've treated me. In spite of the way that you, you, you spoke about me and you defamed me in front of everybody. In spite of how you made me a mockery in, in front of all the people. He said, I will do this when you come and you repent. And he says, I'm going to pour all these blessings out for you. And then he says this. Because this is the part we all often miss. In verse 37. Thus says the Lord God, I will yet for this be inquired of by the house of Israel to do it for them. In other words, this is what God is saying. I'm going to do all of these things, but you're going to have to ask me. Remember what the Bible says, you have not because you ask not. And then when you ask, you ask amiss, in other words, selfishly to waste it upon yourself. So in other words, there's a right way to ask and a wrong way to ask. Wait, I thought God was gracious and merciful and all of these things and he just had to overlook because he took his nasty old blood and slapped it all over me and I should be free. That's the way we, that's the way the Bible says that we look at it in the book of Hebrews when we trample the blood of the son under our feet. Because we have no regard for the Bible. We have no regard for the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed. And this is not the blood of animals and of goats and of sheep and those things. We have no regard. So what we do is we, we, we cleanse in the blood. We run right back out into the mire expecting to come right back into the blood. And then we run out into the mire and come right back into the blood. Just saying to Jesus, your blood doesn't mean anything to me. And he says this. He says, but for all these things... I'll yet be inquired of you. Somebody tells you, and you know somebody has the answer to what you need. And it's it's like this. If you are sick with an incurable disease, and there was some kind of a remedy 
sitting before you in a box somewhere and you didn't know it you'd die in your sickness why? because you didn't ask oh I can tell you this, Jesus Christ, the answer to all of our sickness, all of our diseases, everything that a human being will ever be ailed with sits before us. And he says, I've made you all these promises, but you can't have one of them until you're willing to come and ask me. Oh, pride gets in the way. Oh, that, that self-life likes to get in the way. God is saying, I've got everything you need. But for all of it, every promise the Bible says is yes and amen unto his children. But for all these things, you'll have to ask. Are we willing to ask? Are we ready to ask? Why do you think when we talk about coming to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says we have to believe in our heart confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ came lived he was God he died on a cross he was raised on the third day ascended into heaven seated at the right hand of the father we believe that in our heart but we still have to confess it with our mouth and ask for forgiveness and in asking for forgiveness we receive the forgiveness of God and he cleanses us. The Bible says he's faithful and just. Cleanses us from all of our sins. Washes us clean. Why? Because we believed. Because we were in need. We asked. And his word went to work. It's the same thing with every promise that he has for us. God desires for us to come to him. Would you stand? There have been many times where I looked at our little kids and when they, were, when they were young, they're off to college now, but when they were little, they'd tr frustrate themselves trying to fix something, trying to do something, trying to get this thing done. And, and sometimes you would, you would come to them and you'd say, you know what, I want to, let me help you. And, and no, I can do it myself. See, that's sometimes the attitude that we have with God. I'll, I'll, I, I, I don't need your, I, I can do it myself. And then there were times where I'd just sit there and I'd watch them. And they'd get frustrated and, and everything else. And, and Dad, I just can't do it. I can't do it. I, I, I don't know. And, and almost even to the point of crying. And I would just say, all you had to do was ask. And seeing God is saying to you and me, all you had to do was ask. That's what he desires. If you're here this morning, first and foremost, and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you're watching online, you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, this is the first thing that we need to take care of. The Bible says this, that again, we believe in our heart, we confess with our mouth, Jesus Christ, faithful, just, he forgives us of all of our sins, wipes the slate clean. You get a fresh, a brand new start. And this is but the beginning of a lifelong relationship where you get to learn of this great Savior, your maker, your Savior, your King. And what a joy it'll be as long as you continue to come to Him. If, if that's you and you'd say today, you know what, Pastor? Um, and again, I, I, I'm going to say this. It's, I didn't ask if you know about Jesus because a lot of people know about Jesus just like you can know about a person. You can know all about me. You can know where I'm from, where I was born. You can know where I live. But until you and I sit down and begin to really have a relationship and sit around a table and we, be, we begin to talk and both of us begin to open up and share our thoughts and our hearts with one another, we don't know each other. A lot of people have taken to, to know Christ as, I've got a lot of information on him, so I know Jesus. Well, that's not what I'm asking. Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? If that's you today and you don't, I want to pray with you. And 
what I'm going to do is I'm just going to ask those that are here at the church to pray with us. Because this is, the Bible tells us that God sees the heart. Not so much as hears the words. He sees the heart. And if that's you today and you want to accept and receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want you to pray this prayer with us. Would you pray, Father, forgive me because I am a sinner. Jesus, I know what you did on the cross for me. You gave your body to be broken open and your blood to be poured out for my sins. Forgive me. Jesus, be my Savior, my Lord, and my God. Holy Spirit, come and live in me. Empower me to live my life in a way that honors and pleases the Father. I ask it all in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. What I want to do in these next few moments, and I can tell you this, all of heaven is rejoicing for one person that truly came to the understanding in that relationship with God. It's as if heaven says, stop what you're doing and let's rejoice. So praise God. If that's you, I can tell you heaven is rejoicing because you made a decision to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. But what we want to do in these next few moments is I love coming to the altar. I think we should have an altar at our home. I think, I mean, I like praying while I'm driving down the street. But I think that there should be a place, a special place in your home that you go to and pray. And you get alone with God. What this altar is, is just a place where we come, we lay our burdens down, our hurts, our pains, our disappointments, our insufficiencies, our shortcomings. And we just come before God and we say, God, I can't do it. God, I need you. Remember, you have not because you ask not. And we just lay it down and we say, God, I, I give it to you. And I just need your strength. I need your forgiveness. I need your help. I need, I need you, God, to, to, to use me. Make me usable. I want to be used by you. I want to glorify your name. God, I, I can tell you this. There are things in our lives that, that, that we, are, we, we may not be proud of. But I can tell you, God can help you overcome that. And God can help lift the burdens. God can help free you from whatever it is you are being bound. So what I want to do in these next few moments, and if you're sick, if you have a need, as I said, we believe in divine healing. We believe in the power of God. We believe in deliverance. We believe in all of that. And if you feel the need to come up here for sickness, for any kind of a need, I want you to come up here because we're going to have somebody that's going to agree with you in prayer. And the Bible says that any two as touching anything, asking God, he would do it in Jesus' name. So we're going to agree with you according to the will of God. And I believe that God is going to do some great things. So in the next few moments as we begin to to worship, I want you just to come. And you can already come if you feel the Spirit of God moving on you. Father, right now, as we prepare our hearts, God, to come into this place and lay it all down, God. You know, Father, how many times, God, I've had to come to this altar. How many times, God, I've had to lay burdens down hurts and pains and and God anxious thoughts Lord all of those things God I had I've had to deburden myself time and time again father inadequacies things in my life God that that just didn't glorify you father I pray that God that we would understand the power of your altar God we would understand the power of prayer God that coming before you Lord and allowing you to move in our lives, God, I pray that, God, that you would break everything away. That, God, that once again, Lord, as your word declares, our health would begin to spring forth speedily, God. That, Father, physically and spiritually, God, you would begin to do a work. God, I pray, Father, against oppression, against depression, Father. I pray that, God, that your spirit once again would set the captives free, God, today. For, Father, we are the body of Christ, and you said that we are the light of the world. And you declared unto us, God, lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. 
setting captives free, Father. Letting those, God, that have been held in bondage, God, but for the glory and the honor of your name, God. Father, all we want in this house today is for you to be lifted up and to receive all the glory and all the honor that is due your name, God. May we, Father, shrink into obscurity, God. May we disappear, Father, as you, Father, take center stage in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. We give you all the praise in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Father, we love you, God. God, more than anything, we want you to have your way in our lives, God. God, help us to be obedient, Father, to your word. Help us to be obedient, Holy Spirit to your voice that God that whatever you desire Father that's what we're here for whatever you need whatever you want that's why we're here I pray that God that we would move through this life God with compassion with your eyes oh God with your heart with your spirit oh God let us call upon your name, Father, whenever we need. And realize that, God, that you are all that we will ever need. I thank you, God, for your word. I thank you, God, for those that have come into this house to worship you, Father. I pray that, God, that this is but the beginning of our week. And that, Lord, that this spirit will continue, Father, wherever we go, in everything that we do. And that, God, that our heart would be to glorify you, to bring glory and honor to your name, and to worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' mighty, mighty name, amen. Give him praise. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's so worthy. He's so worthy. He's so worthy. So worthy.